The world thrives on shopping and consuming. Each day we earn, we buy, and we throw away. But even as relentless shopping takes its toll on the planet, a new form of consumerism is on the rise. Eco-consumerism is now defining how people are choosing to produce and shop in order to save the environment. Can businesses and customers rise to this challenge? Rising landfills, polluted oceans, diminishing natural resources, climate change. These environmental shifts have been blamed on mass production and consumerism. As a result, some established brands have begun to take note and revise their practices. Many are beginning to reduce their carbon and plastic footprint and move towards a circular economy where items are recycled and reused in the production process. Consumers are doing their part too and making their concerns known by supporting eco-friendlier products and adopting more sustainable habits. So an eco-consumer is not really a totally different kind of a consumer. It's just consumers who have a much higher level of consciousness and a higher level of willingness to pay for products that they perceive to be sustainable, environmental friendly, etc. Typically, these tend to be younger millennials, Gen Z consumers, middle to upper income. They're usually more connected and they're more politically and socially aware. If you go back 10 years or so, we were talking about eco-friendly consumers, climate change issues, sustainability issue, even then. I think what's changed in the last few years, the discussion has moved from talk to action both from the manufacturer side as well as from the consumer side. Because a lot of the underlying trends have become much more urgent and much more tangibly visible to the common man. After learning about the meat industry's impact on the environment, 25-year-old Singaporean Yu Xuan decided to turn vegan as a teen and stop eating meat. Ever since then, she's cut down her shopping to go zero waste but it hasn't been easy. I think that it is quite difficult to be a green person because the whole economy is so like retail driven, you know, they are always encouraging people to buy more and more. We are so desensitized to the way we purchase. We would buy and then a few weeks later we feel like, oh, I no longer need this, I just throw it away. Out of sight, out of mind. But in fact, we don't see the impact of the things that we are throwing away. So there are a lot of things that I try to buy or make that produce less waste or have less environmental effects. I actually get quite a lot of my groceries from bulk stores, so which is this concept of having things laid out in bulk. Sometimes these bulk stores actually sell things cheaper because they don't have to sell you the packaging. Okay, so there are actually quite a lot of options now. You can buy salt, you can buy oil, you can buy grains, you can buy nuts, all this in bulk. I'm actually at the Conscious Festival by Green is the New Bag today, where they feature a lot of eco-friendly brands. So this is a good way for me to find out what's on the market now, what's happening in the community. Do you mind if I try it? Yeah, put here. Wow, what, what do you all put in it? It's just a bunch oh, of Oh, so cool! Zero waste, yeah, vegan. You put it your stuff and then you just massage it. Oh, yeah. amazing! Okay, I think I'm gonna get one actually. Yeah. Because I have only been buying things that are really essential to me, I have reduced my spending by about like 50 to 70%. It's amazing. As far back as 45 years ago, retail brands began realizing the importance of going green. In the 70s, the body shop pioneered cruelty-free cosmetics and later on, fair trade and bottle recycling. Outdoor wear brand Patagonia has also been at the forefront in reducing its footprint and channels its profits to environmental causes. Even big multinationals like Unilever are recognizing the trend and creating or acquiring green brands. Still, today's eco-consumers are much more discerning and inquisitive about what they're buying and expect accountability and transparency from companies. 
more than 70% of consumers, millennials, say that a brand's purpose is part of the reason why they buy a brand. So they have to buy into your purpose, into your story, and what you are about as a brand. And sustainability and environmental friendliness has to be a part of that story. I personally find that a brand story is very important to me because it really shows me what the brand stands for. But that being said, I also recognise that a brand story can be manufactured in such a way that will attract me. So I do everything with a critical mind. Whenever I look at a product, I try to think of it from start to end. What are the sources and resources that were put into producing that product? Whether there is any waste produced during the supply chain? So it's all these little things that affect my purchasing decision. Next, disruption meets tradition. Find out how some brands are bucking the trend of mass production and going back to basics to make a statement and win customers. From apparel to footwear, the global fashion industry generates some 1.8 trillion US dollars in sales annually. But this success also exacts a huge toll on the environment. Convenient, cheap and trendy, fast fashion in particular has been criticised for creating a disposable approach to buying clothes. So the problem of fast fashion, that's because it's affordable, it somehow devalued what clothes are supposed to be. We are consuming 400 times as compared to two decades ago. Just in Singapore, we are buying 34 new items and throwing away 27 new items annually. So that has become the problem of fast fashion, the overconsumption and production. So slow fashion is a growing movement. It actually is a counterpart of fast fashion, where you care about the people who's making your clothes and the resources that you use. So it's just telling you to slow down your consumption and choose better quality items that can surpass trends. Started in 2014, Kana Goods has built its entire brand on a slow fashion approach. Its trademark modern blue batik with Japanese motifs are all handmade in a small workshop north of Jakarta. Kana Goods itu sebagian besar memang masih menggunakan pewarna yang berasal dari tanaman indigo vera. Ini adalah tong yang berisi larutan indigo untuk bahan pewarna dari kain-kain ini. Kita biasanya sampai enam hari kerja itu untuk pengelupan selembar kain. Jadi untuk mendekati proses eco, kita memanfaatkan air hujan. Indigo adalah magical color karena memang prosesnya tuh unik sekali. Seperti ini, lama-lama menjadi biru. Inspired by Indonesian tradition, Rini wanted to find a natural way to produce batik as they did in the past without using chemical dyes. Pada saat ngewarna itu sungai atau selokan-selokan kalau lagi ngewarna merah, merahlah itu selokan, merahlah warna kuning dan itu larinya ke mana? Ke laut. Mungkin da- sekarang ini enggak kerasa, beberapa tahun itu kan numpuk bahan-bahan kimia yang enggak terurai itu kan numpuk. Itu yang harus kita pikirkan barengan, yuk mari kita sama-sama menyelamatkan bumi walaupun itu sedikit tapi kita lakukanlah sesuatu. At any one time Kana Goods carries a small range of only 20 designs, which they take six months to produce. Apa yang kami hasilkan itu kan semua pakai tangan ya. Dan sampai hari ini belum terpikirkan untuk mass product, namanya dengan cap. Biaya produksi akan lebih murah, lebih cepat bikinnya gitu. Cuman saya belum kepikiran untuk kesana ya. Itu mungkin salah satu yang sedikit menghambat. Menghambat tapi itulah idealis- idealisme kami ya. Priced around 55 to 110 US dollars, Kana's slow fashion approach limits their supply to stores but sets them apart from other brands. Dari awal kita start di 2014 dan animonya itu uh, cukup tinggi dan kita cukup kaget sih surprise dengan animo masyarakat. Rata-rata tiap tahun ini bisa meningkat 50% dan paling tinggi bisa sampai 70%. kan kalau kita tahu batik itu motifnya yang zaman dulu ya. Kalau di Kanaguts ini mereka pakainya batik modern. 
saya juga jadi impresi karena ternyata juga eco friendly dari produksinya, dari pembatiknya juga semua batik tulis jadi masih benar-benar sangat Indonesia banget. In line with their eco image, Kana Goods also offers to redye their customers' clothes at any time if they fade for no extra charge, a service that people appreciate. A recent global survey revealed that 94% of Indonesian consumers want companies to be more sustainable in their practices. In a nation dominated by Gen Z and millennials, eco-influencers like Annabella Jusuf are re-examining how they shop and who they buy from. I was very much into beauty, I was very much into fashion, I had very little awareness on the damage that companies were doing on our environment. More and more consumers, especially in big cities like Jakarta, are becoming more aware of the environmental impacts that their choices are doing. And so they are looking for these responsible businesses to contribute their money to. Spending most of her money on food and cosmetics, Annabella estimates that over the past few years, she's also reduced her wardrobe budget from 200 US dollars to just $7 a month. Come on! So welcome to my unorganized but very eco-friendly and sustainable closet. So most of my items in here are either over three years old or they're thrifted. Very rarely do I buy something new even if it's from a sustainable brand. I also restore a lot of clothes. So these jeans, I swear, I've worn these over a hundred times. And I restored these, they had a rip here. And I, I really like it, I mean, it gives it character. I'm totally for restoring your old clothes. Also, one of the few high-end items that I have, this is the Stella McCartney La Fabella, and it's famous for using 100% recycled materials. And it's also 100% vegan as well. With nearly 100,000 Instagram followers, Annabella also makes a strong effort to promote sustainable local fashion brands, like Slow Living, which makes clothes from discarded fabric. I used to look at the monetary costs of clothes, and that's what would make me determine what I would buy. But it's, it's so much more than that. It's the environmental cost as well. It's the workers' cost as well. And a poorly made dress from a fast fashion brand is not going to la last you more than 10 wears. Whereas a high quality dress, you can wear over a hundred times. So in the end, it becomes cheaper. But part of being an eco-consumer is also shopping less. You know, it's buying less makeup products. It's buying less new clothes. Beyond slow fashion, another novel trend is emerging in the secondhand fashion market, swapping. Launched in 2018, the Fashion Pulpit is a boutique in Singapore that allows people to bring in their used clothes to trade in with other designs. What started as a mission to raise awareness of sustainability issues grew into a social cause with a storefront to help turn talk into action. In our closet, we only use about 20%. So what happens to the 80% of our clothes that are still in good condition? It, it becomes like a passive landfill at some point. When you are swapping, you are prolonging the lifespan of the items that you have and lessening the textile waste because you're not throwing it away. The Fashion Pulpit operates on a different business model from regular shops or thrift stores. While walk-in customers can buy used clothes off the rack or do a one-time swap for a small fee, most people pay for a monthly membership subscription to become regular swappers. The more clothes they bring in, the more they can swap. Word of mouth. It's 80% of how, how we get signed up. It's because friends are telling their friends, like when they ask them, like, where did you get your clothes that you're wearing now? And they share about the swap concept. With members swapping 20 to 50 items a month, Ray estimates that they've saved over 30,000 pieces of apparel since they started. He aims to harness this surplus further by creating an upcycled fashion line everyone is becoming more of their own stylist and secondhand is an opportunity for them to express that with the amount of alternative that they can get. In the West, the secondhand market is booming. In 2018, the used fashion industry turned over 24 billion US dollars in America. And by 2028, 
experts project that used clothes will overtake new fashion in revenues, with players like ThreadUp and The Real Real leading the way. Alongside fashion, food is another staple that we all can't live without. And businesses are experimenting with offerings that appeal to today's eco-conscious consumers. The world's eco-challenges require innovation and disruption. In today's overwhelming consumer space, businesses are trying to figure out how to engineer more sustainable solutions, particularly with food. One of the most successful eco-food products ever launched, the plant-based Impossible Burger claims that it is made using 95% less land, 74% less water, and emits less greenhouse gas compared to regular beef production. Optimistically, research firm UBS has forecast robust growth for plant-based meats that could reach 85 billion US dollars by 2030. Beyond the issue of sustainable production, the ongoing problem of food wastage is something that Singapore startups are trying to fix. Three years ago, I witnessed my family members throwing out consumable but expiring food items from the refrigerator. And I felt that perhaps there could be a platform to be built to redistribute such food away. And I did a bit more market research and realised that the problem was not confined to only households. It was a bigger societal problem involving businesses. The United Nations estimates that over one trillion US dollars worth of food is wasted every year over 1.2 billion tons of food. That's about over 2 million A380 jumbo jets. So that's quite a scary amount of waste. In 2017, Treat Sure was born to tackle this perennial problem one meal at a time. So Treat Sure is a startup that uses technology and through our mobile app, we connect businesses with surplus food to the consumers who would treasure them. There are now two business segments that we have, one dealing with buffet wastage and the other dealing with grocery wastage. For the buffets, it's actually a takeaway box concept where customers at the last stretch of each buffet meal slot could come in to pack food at the hotel partners that we work with at $10 per box. With the app, you will know which are the hotel that's open for the Trisha Box Buffet. You just need to show the app to the counter staff. They scan the app, they give you a box to pick up the food. The patrons will be allowed to come 45 minutes before closing up the buffet so that they also have ample time to choose what they like rather than just throw in a bin. We are happy for now because we currently have two restaurants that are serving buffet, cooking more than 2,000 covers for breakfast, lunch and dinner. Over the past two years since we launched in 2017, our user base has exceeded the 10,000 mark, a four times increase in our user base since last year. It really pains me when I think about how much food is being wasted in like hotel buffets like all around the world at every single meal. So when I found th like this app doing something like that, I thought it was a really great opportunity to one, both satisfy my food craving and also like reduce some of that food wastage. Working on a revenue-sharing model with its partners, Treacher also offers delivery and pickup options for grocery items with short expiry dates. One of Treacher's vendors is Ugly Food, another startup which addresses food waste in the supply chain. The company collects and resells discarded but edible produce both online and at its store. So Ugly Food mission is to maximize the value of food resources of what we have. So as a start, where we source our produce is actually through the usual wet markets that we see in the food stalls. So we actually go down and ask them whether they have any blemished fruits and vegetables. But along the way, we also start asking higher along the supply chain because we realise there's more wastage. Supermarkets routinely reject odd-looking or ugly produce that they feel won't sell and throw it away. Though some European countries have enacted laws to stop this wastage, it's still a widespread practice globally. Beyond ugly food, there's also another type of food wastage that is 
happening daily, which is over import and surplus produce. But sometimes there might be an overestimation and that result in surplus, but have to be clear because of the new goods that is coming in already. So at times they actually have to throw it away instead. To extend the life of their unsold produce, Ugly Food also makes popsicles in different fruit flavors. With five-figure sales revenues, it's created a new avenue of growth for them. For our brand story, it's all about ignoring the outside imperfections and seeing what's the beauty within. So it has been very useful for our growth because people think that it's an innovative idea to turn something ugly into something beautiful just by repackaging it. While startups like Treacher and Ugly Food aim to keep things affordable for consumers, many other eco products, from metal straws to organic food, are often more expensive compared to their traditional counterparts. If you go back 10 years, consumers were unwilling to pay any premium at all for an environmental friendly product. Clearly, things have changed where consumers now feel it's actually okay to pay some premium because the importance of being eco friendly has increased in their mind. The other part is the fact that as businesses start scaling up their solutions, they will also become cheaper. A lot of sustainable and eco-friendly products, in the long term, they're, they're a good investment. It's just higher costs up front. Even like buying a tumbler is of course more expensive than buying a plastic water bottle. But once that investment is made, you can just continue to refill it. And in the long run, you save more money. To be financially sustainable is the key before we talk about even the environmental sustainability aspect. The good news is that things are changing. In a 2018 US survey, nearly 50% of shoppers said they were willing to support more sustainable goods, and their spending continues to reflect this upward trend. Today's eco-consumers in particular are much more vocal in promoting a greener lifestyle. In Singapore, Yushan started the Ground Zero Festival with her friends, a grassroots event that's been growing every year since 2018. The most important thing was to connect consumer to producer, in that we showed people that, oh, you don't have to worry, there are so many options for you in Singapore. You can buy your skincare from this little local store, you can buy your groceries from this other store. So this was helpful in creating a network, creating a community of eco-friendly people and organisations in Singapore. Almost every consumer will become an eco-consumer. Uh, that's because on the supply side, once the manufacturers transform their supply chains in terms of sourcing, production, distribution and everything, they will not go back to the old way of producing things anymore. So all their products will become eco-friendly products. And on the consumer side, you know, the millennial consumers of today will by default demand products that are very environmentally friendly. So I think this will be the mainstream in the next one or two decades.